Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Into the Killing. In today's episode, we'll take a look at one of the most famous cases of a missing child in American history. The missing boy became synonymous with the missing kids on the milk cartons campaign. Even though the case generated an enormous amount of media attention, it would take decades for it to be solved. For this episode, we're going to New York City in 1979. That year was a record-setting bloody year in the Big Apple. There were nearly 1,700 murders in that last year of the 1970s. The case we're talking about happened on May 25th, 1979. In a tragic, ironic way, the number one song on the Billboard charts was reunited by Peaches and Herb. May 25th was the last day before the Memorial Hall Day weekend. It was a hectic morning in the loft where the Pates family lived in Soho, which is in Lower Manhattan. At 8 a.m., Stan Pates, a commercial photographer, was still in bed. His wife, Julie, ran a small daycare out of the loft. She was dealing with her two-year-old son, Ari, and another child who slept over that night. Their daughter, eight-year-old Shira, did not want to get out of bed. Their six-year-old son, Aton, was up and ready to go to school. That morning, he had made his own breakfast. He made his usual toast and chocolate milk. He then picked up his lunch bag and headed to the front door. Recently, Aton had been seeking more independence. He regularly asked his parents to walk alone to the bus stop since other kids in his class were allowed to. It turned out that day was a big day for Aton because his mother finally said yes. Aton was to walk two blocks to his bus stop where the school bus would pick him up. Aton put on his hat, which was a pilot's hat, that read Future Flight Captain. He was also wearing a blue corduroy jacket blue jeans, and blue sneakers. He had a dollar on him, and he planned on buying a soda on the way to the bus stop. It was a drizzly day in Soho. Julie hugged Aton and gave him a kiss goodbye and told him to hurry home after school. She watched him walk down the street. She then went back to the loft. That afternoon, Julie became worried when six-year-old Aton didn't come home. She called around and learned that he didn't make it to school that day. Stan and Julie reported Aton missing that afternoon. A massive search was launched. This included the police going door-to-door. Stan Pates was a photographer and he had taken several photos of Aton. Aton's photo was splashed across all forms of media. 24 of the longest hours of Julie and Stan's life went by. Every minute was probably wrought with agony. The most important time in any crime is the first 48 hours. Sadly, those 48 hours passed and no viable lead was found. Missing person posters featuring Aton's photos were plastered all over New York, but still, no trace of him was found. In October 1979, six months after Aton went missing, the police released a sketch of a man that was created based on the description of a man who a woman claimed she saw talking to a boy who resembled Aton. She said she saw them talking on the day Aton went missing about three blocks from his home. The man was described as 40 years old, white, with blue eyes and dyed blonde hair. He was thin and he had freckles. What was odd was that the woman approached the police shortly after Aton went missing and said she saw him talking to the man. But the police didn't get her to talk to a sketch artist until September, nearly three months after Aton went missing. 
Unfortunately, no viable tips were generated from the sketch. It wasn't long before Aton Pate's case went cold. On the afternoon of July 27, 1981, six-year-old Adam Walsh went to a Sears in Hollywood, Florida with his mother, Reve. Reve wanted to ask about a lamp, so she left Adam at a kiosk where some kids were playing an Atari video game system. When Reve came back, she discovered that Adam was missing. Like with Aton, a massive search was launched. Two weeks later, Adam's severed head was found in a drainage ditch about 130 miles from the mall. The rest of his remains have never been found. Reve and Adam's father, John Walsh, kept Adam's story in the media in the hopes that it would lead to an arrest. Unfortunately, no one was ever convicted of Adam's murder. Aton's disappearance and Adam's murder were not connected, but both cases would have a major impact on American society. On May 25, 1983, the fourth anniversary of Aton Pate's disappearance, President Ronald Reagan declared it National Missing Children's Day. In October 1983, NBC aired a made-for-TV movie about the abduction and murder of Adam Walsh called Adam. 38 million people watched the original airing. Adam's murder and Aton's disappearance are considered two key cases in the mid-1980s Stranger Danger panic. Children in the United States and abroad were being taught not to talk to and definitely not to go anywhere with someone they didn't know. In the spring of 1985, Aton Pates became one of the first kids on the milk cartons. At that point, over 700 independent dairies, about half in the country, had started putting pictures of missing children on their cartons. Aton is often cited as the first kid on the milk carton. But that macabre honor goes to two other boys. In August 1984, Henderson Erickson Dairy in Des Moines, Iowa, printed photos and short bios of two boys who went missing. The first boy to go missing was 12-year-old Johnny Gosh. He vanished while delivering newspapers at West Des Moines, Iowa on September 5, 1982. The second boy, Eugene Martin, also vanished while delivering newspapers. He went missing nearly two years after Johnny on August 12, 1984. Unfortunately, neither Johnny nor Eugene have ever been found dead or alive, and no one has ever been brought to justice for their disappearances. So while Aton Pace wasn't the first kid on the milk carton, he's arguably the most famous, and he became synonymous with the campaign. But fortunately, the milk cartons did not generate any leads in the case. We're just going to take a short break from this episode to bring you a word from our sponsor, HelloFresh. One of my least favorite household tasks is meal planning. I really don't like spending time every few days trying to figure out what meals to make to appease everyone in the house without repeating too many meals from the week before. Frankly, it can be downright frustrating. Then, I have to go to the grocery store, and I end up buying ingredients I'll only use for one meal, and end up tossing out the rest. That's why I love HelloFresh, which is America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh makes meal planning easy and fun. I simply pick out the meals I want, and they ship it to me. The meals are easy to make. I can have a delicious and nutritious dinner on the table in less than 30 minutes. It's also great value. HelloFresh is restaurant quality meals, but 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal. It's even 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store. I've made a few meals with HelloFresh, and they've been excellent. One meal I made was Italian chicken and lemony pepper sauce with roasted potatoes, and it was outstanding. As Guy Fieri would say, you could eat the lemony pepper sauce on a flip-flop. And I was able to make that meal on a busy night between work and at board game night with my friends. You should check out HelloFresh for yourself. 
go to HelloFresh.com slash listed 12 and use the code CRIMLYLISTED12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Once again, to get 12 free meals plus free shipping from America's number one meal kit, go to HelloFresh.com slash CRIMLYLISTED12 and use the code CRIMLYLISTED12. In November 1989, nearly 10 years after Aton's disappearance, the investigators publicly acknowledged that they had a suspect in the case. It turned out that the suspect first popped up on the police's radar in 1982, about three years after Aton's disappearance. In March 1982, a 38-year-old mentally ill man named Jose Ramos was accused of luring two boys into a drain pipe in the Bronx. In the drain pipe, the police found several photos of Ramos with young boys. Several of the boys were blonde. One of the boys looked a lot like Aton. The police questioned Ramos and they learned that he had a connection to the Pates family. It turned out that he had dated a woman who knew the Pates family. For a short time in the spring of 1975, during a school bus strike, the woman had been paid to walk Aton and two of his classmates home from school. But the police could find nothing else to connect Ramos to Aton's disappearance. So Ramos was in charge in connection with the disappearance, but he was sent to a psychiatric hospital and he stayed there for six months. In June 1986, Jose Ramos was arrested after he sexually assaulted an eight-year-old boy who was camping with his parents in the Algany National Forest in Pennsylvania. After Ramos was arrested, another family came forward and said that Ramos had sexually assaulted their two sons as well. The boys were five years old and nine years old at the time of the assaults. In January 1987, Ramos went to trial for molesting the two brothers. He was convicted of corruption of a minor and indecent assault. He was sentenced to three and a half years to seven years of prison. In June 1988, a detective with the NYPD's Missing Persons Division and a U.S. attorney interviewed Ramos regarding the disappearance of Aton Pates. They asked him what he was doing on the day Aton disappeared. Ramos explained that he went to Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. He said that he came across a young boy and he thought it might have been the boy who went missing. Ramos said that the boy was blonde with blue eyes and he was wearing a dark jacket and dark shoes. Ramos said that he was 90% sure that the boy he talked to was the kid who went missing. He said that he brought the boy back to his apartment. The investigators asked Ramos why he brought the boy back to his apartment and he gave a blunt response. He said it was for sex. Ramos said that the boy didn't want to have sex so he decided to take the boy back to the park. They got into a taxi and traveled to Soho. When they got there, the boy said he wanted to visit his aunt who lived in Washington Heights. Ramos said he walked the boy to a subway station and that was the last time he saw him. The investigators did not believe Ramos' story, but they were convinced that he was the man who kidnapped, raped, and murdered Aton Pates. The problem was that they had zero physical evidence. They didn't even have a confession. Ramos said that he was 90% sure that the boy he met up with was Aton, but he did not say anything about hurting him. So the investigators couldn't charge Ramos with anything. In October 1990, Jose Ramos pleaded guilty to involuntary deviant sexual intercourse for sexually abusing the 9-year-old boy at the campground in Pennsylvania. The following month, he was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison. While Ramos was in prison, Aton's father, Stan, would send him something special every year on Aton's birthday and the day he disappeared. 
It was one of Aton's missing persons flyers. On the back of the flyers, there was a typewritten message, and it always said the same thing. What did you do to my little boy? In June 2000, the police searched the basement apartment where Jose Ramos lived when Aton went missing. It had been over 21 years since Aton vanished. But the search turned up nothing of interest. In June 2001, Stan and Julie had Aton pronounced dead. This allowed them to sue Jose Ramos for the wrongful death of their son. And they did just that. In spring 2004, in a civil lawsuit, Ramos was found responsible for the death of Aton. The Pace family was awarded $2 million. The problem was that before Ramos went to prison in 1987, he was a poor drifter. So he would have never been able to pay the Pates family the $2 million he was ordered to pay. But for the Pates family, it was never about the money. Instead, the lawsuit was about finding someone legally responsible for the disappearance of their son. The ruling did just that. According to civil records, Jose Ramos killed Aton Pates. So, that's the end of the case, and we get cue the outro music. Actually, it turned out, that isn't the end of the case. In 2009, Cyrus Vance Jr. was campaigning to become District Attorney for New York County. One of his promises was that he would reopen Aton Pates' case. Vance was elected, and he kept his promise. Two years after he took office, the police searched a basement that was about 200 feet from Aton's home. A handyman who supposedly had contact with Aton before he went missing had used the basement as his workshop. The police said that they had evidence that Aton was in the basement before he vanished. Also, a concrete floor had been poured in the basement shortly after Aton disappeared. But the search of the basement turned up nothing. However, the search had whipped up a lot of media attention. That media attention led to someone calling in a tip. That particular tip led to an arrest. On May 24, 2012, a day shy of the 33rd anniversary of Aton's disappearance, the police announced that they had a suspect in custody. It was a 51-year-old man named Pedro Hernandez who lived in Maple Shade, New Jersey, with his wife and daughter. Hernandez had not been considered a suspect until the police received the tip. Hernandez was brought into the police station for questioning on May 23rd. After several hours of interrogation, he confessed to the murder. Hernandez explained that when Aton went missing, he was 18 years old and he was working as a stock clerk at a bodega close to Aton's bus stop. He saw Aton that morning and asked him if he wanted a soda. He then led Aton to the basement of the bodega. He said that once they were in the basement, he started strangling the six-year-old. He said that he tried to stop, but he couldn't. He then put Aton's body in a bag and then placed the bag in a box. He then set the box out with the trash in an alley about a block from the bodega. He thought that Aton was alive when he put him out with the trash. Hernandez did not give a motive for attacking Aton. He said that he didn't sexually assault him. The problem with the confession was that there was absolutely no physical evidence to back up what Hernandez said. But the police had learned that Hernandez had confessed to killing a child to several people. The person who called in the tip that led to Hernandez's arrest was his sister's husband, Jose Lopez. Lopez said that he thought that Hernandez killed Aton after he learned that Hernandez confessed to murdering a boy in a prayer group. 
The prayer group had at least 15 people in it. Hernandez supposedly fell to his knees and started crying. He said that he abused a boy and then strangled him to death. After this confession, Hernandez's family slowly learned about his confession. It became an open secret in the family. In 1982, Hernandez was preparing to get married. He confessed to his fiance that he had killed someone. But he had called his victim Muchacho, so she thought that the victim was a teenager. Hernandez said that the muchacho had tried to violate him and he responded violently. His fiance thought that the young man had made unwanted advances, so Hernandez responded with violence and killed the young man. In 1979, shortly after the murder, Hernandez went to a religious retreat. He told a church elder that he had killed a child. But the church leader did not connect the confession to the disappearance of Aton. A major question that came out afterward was why had no one come forward sooner? Hernandez's sister said that in the 1980s she went to the police in Camden, New Jersey with the information. But she said nothing was done with her tip. The Camden Police Department denied they overlooked the information. They said that they didn't have a record of Hernandez's sister coming forward with the information. Jose Lopez, Hernandez's brother-in-law who made the tip that led to Hernandez's arrest, said that he tried to contact investigators on several occasions. But for reasons that were never specified, he was never able to report his tip. In November 2012, Jose Ramos, the man initially believed to be Aton's killer, was released from prison in Pennsylvania after serving the maximum sentence of 27 years. But he was arrested immediately for not providing a valid address as to where he would be living once he exited prison. The trial of Pedro Hernandez for the murder of Aton Pates began on January 30th, 2015. The prosecution had no physical evidence. Instead, they just had the people whom Hernandez had confessed to testify. The defense pointed out that Hernandez had an IQ of about 70, which is in the bottom 2 percentile. He had also been diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder. This made it difficult for him to tell the difference between reality and fantasy. The defense argued that the confession had been coerced. Also, the defense pointed out that another man, Jose Ramos, had already been found legally responsible for Aton's murder in 2004. The trial lasted four months. The jury deliberated for 18 days. Then, a mistrial was declared. Eleven jurors had voted guilty but one juror said he could not vote to convict Hernandez. After the trial, Julian Stan Pates asked for the decision from their civil suit against Jose Ramos to be reversed. It was reversed in the summer of 2016. Pedro Hernandez's second trial began on October 19, 2016. Once again, it lasted four months. Much of it was the same evidence and arguments from the first trial. The jury deliberated for nine days. On February 14, 2017, nearly 38 years after six-year-old Aton Pates went missing, Pedro Hernandez was found guilty of felony murder and kidnapping. In April 2017, Hernandez was sentenced to 25 years to life. It is unclear where Hernandez is serving his sentence. There is no record of his status in the New York inmate database. At the time of this recording, he is 60 years old. The whereabouts of Jose Ramos is also unclear.
After he was arrested for giving an invalid address, he was sentenced to 6 to 20 years in prison. In October 2018, he filed an appeal. In February 2020, the court said that they would reconsider his appeal. But the results of the appeal are unknown, as are his whereabouts. He is not listed in the Pennsylvania inmate database. At the time of this recording, if Jose Ramos is still alive, he's 78 years old. Sadly, Aton Pate's remains have never been found. While their son was missing, Julian Stan Pates never moved out of their Soho loft and they kept the same phone number. They had always held out hope that Aton might be alive, he might come home or call them. In 2019, 40 years after their six-year-old son disappeared, they sold their loft. They moved from New York City to Hawaii, where they currently reside. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. As always, our fact checker, producer, and sound designer was Anel Cloutier. She has an awesome Instagram account and you should follow her. A link to her account is in the description box. If you like this podcast, please subscribe or follow so you don't miss any future episodes. If you just found this podcast, please check out Criminally Listed on YouTube. We have over 275 videos featuring some unsettling and bizarre true crime stories. You can find us at youtube.com slash criminally listed. Well, that's all for this week. Thanks again for listening. Please take care of yourself and stay safe.